Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and we're continuing the series Master Databricks and Apache Spark. This is lesson 21, continuing with Python and PySpark using RDDs, better known as Resilient Distributed Datasets. Where are we going? We'll start out with what is an RDD. We'll talk about lazy evaluation, a critical concept on Spark, transformations, and actions. So let's start with what is an RDD. As I mentioned, it stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset. What does that mean? Well, in a nutshell, it's a fault tolerant collection of elements that can be operated on in parallel, which may not really help much <laughs> because it's a little bit complicated to say that. All it really means is, as you know, when I did my earlier introductions to Spark, I talked about taking the data into breaking into chunks. Remember the phone book, broke it up, and you gave a partition the chunk of data to different nodes in the cluster. And the idea is that by breaking up into smaller pieces, then you could run your operations on each chunk in parallel, meaning at the same time, and then bring the results from each chunk together. So each node sends those results of what it had together, and that goes to the driver. So that's all that's talking about. The fault tolerant aspect means that Spark knows how to reconstruct the RDD if it needs to. So you have a great deal of fault tolerance, and that's good because things fail, especially if you have hardware that could go out into a large node. You don't want to necessarily lose a massive amount of work. I need to point out too, RDDs are immutable. That means you can't change them. Now, it's not really a big deal. A lot of things in Python are also immutable. It just means that when you do things that would require a change, you just create it, you get back a new copy of it or a different copy than the original. You can't change it in place. Probably the most important thing to know about RDDs is that that is the fundamental uh, data level or object in Spark. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of things you'll hear about data frames and data sets, and we're going to get a lot into those later. But regardless of what else you're doing, at the end of the day, Spark is going to turn all, this stem, all these things down to a resilient a set of resilient distributed data sets. So when it goes through creating a plan to work on data frames, it will turn it into RDDs and then it works at that level. And that's So that's the data currency of Spark. And therefore, when you're trying to do things later, when you get into more advanced things like trying to performance tune, it helps to know about RDDs. So next concept, lazy evaluation, kind of like this kid that doesn't want to do any work here or whatever. The idea here is that Spark uses a concept called lazy evaluation. And what it means is Spark will only do something when it's forced to. At first, it seems a little strange, but then you have to step back and realize that when you're doing something in Spark, you could be talking about petabytes of data, billions of rows, trillions of rows even. And if you were to just make a little mistake in your typing and said, oh yeah, sum up this row, multiply it by this other, I should say column, multiply this column by this column, or this attribute by this, or do some, work on the data set, it could kick off a lot of work. All these nodes running in parallel, the lights dimming, a lot of work. And you might say, oh no, that was a mistake. So what Spark does instead is, it actually is really efficient. When you do transformations, it starts tracking it. And it will only do the actual work when you force it to. And the way you force it is by executing what's called an action. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Transformations create new RDDs from an existing RDD. Now, remember what I said, RDDs are immutable. So the only way you can make changes is by applying things to the RDD and then creating a new copy, and that's what happens. The actions, when we see those in a minute again, but an action will return the result to the driver. That's important because you've got to make sure the driver has enough memory to take back the results. So let's start getting a little deeper with what is a transformation. Transformations applies logic to the data set to change it. So I've done a lot of work with ETL, extract, transform, load, on other database environments like SQL Server. And the concept really comes down to you bring data in from somewhere and you start making changes to it. Maybe you need to take this column and multiply it by this column. Maybe you need to uh, reformat a string and get rid of, you know, take just the first five characters Maybe you want to do a calculation on some value, et cetera, et cetera. Those are called transformations. And many times in this work, 
you kind of do some work on what you brought in and you write it out again. Then you bring that in again and you go over it again until you finally get to a final data set that is really good and ready to be used. Similar things, that similar concept applies to Spark. Spark will use the transformation and it applies logic to a data set to make a change to it. Now, before I get into specific ones, let me step back for a minute. It can apply many levels of transformations uh, in a row for you. So what's a little different here is Spark is kind of keeping a notepad, if you will. Okay, Brian did transformation one, great. Then he wanted to do this other transformation. Okay, then he did another and another. And Spark actually doesn't execute the transformations, as I said, but it's keeping a notebook or a log of what you've asked it to do. And then at the end you say, okay, go do it. And now it's interesting because Power BI has a similar thing if you've ever used it. When you start doing transformations, it has like a little tick book and it'll say, okay, there's this one and this one and this one. And it also won't do it until it needs to, <clears throat> but you can click little X's and back off the transformations that it did. So I don't know if you've seen something similar, but just think of this as a chore, a list. You saw that kid in the chair earlier. Think of it as you gave the person a list of chores to do. And it's only at the end when they can check it all off that they're done. This is powerful. When I think of this list of chores, this list of work that are transforming the data, um, another word you could use for that is a pipeline. It's very popular now with all these big data tools. So the pipeline is you start with your data in the beginning and then bring it in from wherever or just create your data set. And then you start applying changes and keep going and keep going. And finally, you send out the results. So that's what's going on here. So the transformations are applying logic to make changes to your data set. One type of transformation, and these are done as in the form of functions, is called map. Map will actually pass each element in this resilient distributed data set through a function you define to do whatever it is you want to do with that data and pass back the new row, the updated changes. Filters allow you to take the rows within this RDD and if you can imagine, just like any filter, it will filter out what you don't want. So only where X, Y is it's true, and you'll get a subset of elements. You can also do something called a sample, which is great because imagine you have you know a billion rows, and you really want to return a small sample. Maybe you want to put through a machine learning model that's open source on the head node, the driver node. You could do that by just getting a small sample. So sample will do that. Again, these are transformations, though. They don't do anything until we get a what? Action. So what is an action? An action executes pending transformations. They return the results to the driver. An example of this is count. If you think, OK, we brought in a data set. Maybe we're doing all these transformations. And now you say, well, I need a count of this. The only way Spark can get a count and give it to you is to actually do the work. So a count will force a transformation. Reduce is another one. Reduce is similar to count, but it allows you a lot of flexibility in how you want to do this type of aggregation. And so you can do any number of aggregations using a reduce function. And so reduce also is an action which will force the execution of pending transformations. Collect is very specific in what it says is, look, I know you have all this stuff sitting out there waiting to do. Collect says, do it and give me the results. Now I have a little caution there because when you do a collect, you have to make sure that the data set you're returning, the number of rows and the volume, will not overload the driver. Because if you do, you can crash your cluster. So be aware of that. You're not supposed to be bringing back a trillion rows to your driver. It's not a good idea. Instead, you could do something like take. Take is really good for development and testing. We say, I'd like to see this. Let me just do a take and get like two rows back. And the end there is the number of rows. So you say take and then parentheses two. And you'll just get two rows from the data set back. So you're not going to overload the driver, but you force an execution of the transformations. By the way, these transformations and actions are a small subset of all the ones available for you. There's many. I'll do a demonstration also, which is just going to show you a sort of small subset. Let's do a demonstration of the things we've talked about so far. And we, when you see concrete examples, I think things become clearer. One thing I do want to explain to you is that when you're in a notebook or whatever IDE you're using to connect to Spark, of course, in Databricks case, we'll use the Databricks notebook. There's a couple of ways you can connect in. The sort of traditional way is using SC, which stands for Spark Context. And there's a function it uses to establish the Spark Context. 
But with Databricks, it's automatically created for you. And I can just show you here that that variable is called SC. And it's got some properties with it. So it's, I can go to the Spark UI, but it shows me the version, Spark, etc. And it's giving me a shell or connection into the Spark cluster. So it's a way for me to connect to the Spark cluster and send through instructions and run applications. Now the Spark session here, when that variable, as you can see, it's already there, but I'll show, run it again. That actually combines Spark context with Hive connectivity. So when you do Spark SQL, you're doing Hive functionality, you would typically use Spark to do that, that particular variable. And the nice thing about the Spark session is that it not only includes the ability to do SQL, but it can also do things that require the Spark context. We're going to use SC for this because most of the examples and things you see online also use the Spark context. So here we can see uh, I want to use SC and then the method text file, which we'll read in a text file from us. I will put all of this, of course, in the link below, which you can go out in GitHub and get the code and the notebook. Uh, here we're going to be pulling in a file I uploaded to DBFS, hamlet-1.txt. And so I can run that and let's see what we got. Doesn't do anything, sorry. So, so that just read it in. Let's see what happens when we try to just display it, if we just put the object in. Notice all it does is tells us where this is pointing to. Again, the poem underscore RDD1 is distributed. And that means that you can't just display it because it's all over the cluster. You need to bring it back before you can do that, which would be one of the actions, right? So let's start looking at how we use this. So if I wanted to just see some of the data, I can force an action on the RDD without even doing any real transformation. I'll just use a take. And the take will actually show me what the data looks like. And you can see here, it's Hamlet's soliloquy. Soliloquy. <laughs> All right. By the way, let me show you what that looks like. This has the typical Hamlet's poem, to be or not to be, that is the question, and on and on. We're just going to play with it in this example. Notice that it had rows of data. Each sentence was in its, in its own row. And that's going to figure into it. Each row becomes an element in the RDD. So now that we have our RDD, we're going to run on this RDD poem underscore RDD1. We're going to run the map function. And in the map function or method, we pass in our function. We're going to use Python's lambda function. A lambda function is just a function in place or on, on the fly function basically. So we don't have to create a separate function definition somewhere. We'll just do it right where we are. And it has a short cut method of programming this in which we give it the parameter name after lambda, a colon, and then the definition of the function itself. In this case, we're just calling the Python built-in function length s. So what it's really going to do is every element in the RDD is going to be passed into this and the length is returned. And that length will be collected in this new RDD, which is line lengths. So line lengths, when this is done, will have each row will contain a the length of each line. The next part of this total length is just going to take total line lengths and it's going to run a reduce function and reduced is an action, but the reduce function is going to run another lambda function. And what this is going to be doing is going to be taking two elements in. So it's going to take one element, then the next element, and it's going to use a plus b. So what it's going to do is take the line lengths and just add them up. It's going to give us a grand total. So we'll get the total number of characters in this by printing the total line length. So kind of iterating over this or reviewing this, this is a transformation, right, to get all the line lengths and return that as an RDD. And this reduce function is going to give us back one number. It's going to tally up all of the lengths and return the result. And we can see this here. The total length is 1,374 characters. So a little confusing, but the main thing to understand is I can do any number of transformations, but when I do an action, it's going to return a result and it will execute the pipeline. So let me try something a little different here. This is one method. Up here, what I did is I brought the data in from some sort of external source. So you can bring in data from like an HDFS source, which is what this is like, or I can bring it in from in Azure. I could use uh, ADLS or something, yeah, to get that in Azure Data Lake. But I can also, of course, define something on the fly. So here, 
I'm going to say parallelize. And let me run this and I'll kind of get a better idea. And all this is really doing is the parallelize, parallelize function will take what you pass in the list and each element will go to a different node. So essentially this is creating a separate partition for each one, which is obviously not the most efficient thing for just a list of numbers. And then we can do a count. So the this part of it is going to create the RDD. It's not technically a transformation because it's just creating an RDD. And this shows us that we can create RDDs without bringing it in from a source. And then here I'll do a count. And then you say, yep, five. And again, if I wanted to say try to print the RDD in this case, I won't make get anything that makes sense because this is distributed. But I could do, again, the take statement to just see some of it like that. So here I say take three, and I just get three elements. If I wanted to know how many partitions do I have, this is two. Now, this was the original one I did when I was bringing in the Hamlet soliloquy. That's two partitions. Now, I want to do something a little fancier. Instead of using a lambda function, I'm going to use an actual formal Python function called transfunc. And each line is going to be passed into this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take each line, and I'm going to convert it to a lowercase. So I should get all lowercase for each line back. Then I'm going to take it and split it. Now by default, split will break it on spaces. So I should get each word in a separate return separately. This is going to come back. Lines.lower will come back and replace lines. And then that valid that list of lines values will be split and return back to lines again. And then we'll go back to lines here. So probably not the best coding to return things back using the same variable. But what we'll end up doing, as we can see, I'll run this and we'll see what it does, is we now have everything in lowercase. And notice that every word has been separated now, separated out by commas. To do this, we called the RDD, and we called the map function, and we passed in that our function, which is up here. That's all we did. And at the end, I just did take five, so I could force it to execute the transformation also so I could see the results. Notice, as I mentioned, each element in the RDD is a separate row because of the way the data is stored. It's each row is separate. Okay. Now if I do flat map, flat map does the th same thing, but it changed it so that each word becomes a separate element. And the biggest takeaway with flat map, besides the fact that it had that different behavior, is that while map always returns the same number of elements as the input elements from the RDD. Flat map does not have to do it. As you can see, we had rows come in, but now the rows are broken up into multiple words separately. So the, it changes the dimensions of what's going back. Another thing we can do is I just want to get distinct values. And here I'm using the RDD3 I created. And I just want to get distinct lists of words. And I'll just do three. And it gave me a distinct list here of some of the words. Notice what I can do is that I can append distinct, and then I can append an action to it. So here I am doing a transformation followed by an action. So you can, nice thing because Python allows that too, is that you can just keep stacking some of what you're doing. So it becomes a little mini pipeline. So this is kind of cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create some skip words. And here I'm going to say filter. And I'm going to be doing this lambda function, which is going to really iterate over this and say when x is not in skip words. So for each each element that comes through the RDD3, each word, it's going to make sure that it's not in the list of skip words. And then I'll only get back what's not in skip words. And that result is coming back because remember, these are immutable. So the RDD is going to be returned to RDD4, poem underscore RDD4. And I'll just take some, and you'll see what I mean. So now you're getting distinct words um, as long as they're not in the skip words. You may want to skip over certain sort of useless words that you don't want to look at. And finally, I just want to do one little quick example here. We're going to do another parallel parallelize <laughs> using the range function just to get from 1 to 500 values. And what I'm going to do here is just show you that you can get some statistical calculations out of that. So what I got here is the numbers RDD max gave back 499. Numbers RDD min came up with 1, and on and on. So you can see the sum, variance, 
and standard deviation. So this is kind of nice that you can get some quick calculations on your RDDs and it's doing the work for you. So wrapping up, we talked about what is an RDD, a resilient distributed data set. We learned that they are fault tolerant, you can't, indestructible, you can't destroy them. That Spark is actually keeping track of how to reconstruct them if something does happen to them. And that's to make sure that we don't lose a lot of work. We talked about lazy evaluation. And the idea of lazy evaluation is that we can do lots and lots of transformations, but Spark is only gonna do something when we ask it to give us a result, and then it needs to do the work. And when we're doing things we call transformations, that's where it's taking an RDD, doing kind of work on it, and giving back a new RDD. And we can do this any number of times. And then finally, we call an action, it's gonna execute whatever pending transformations there are and give back a result. So that's it. I wanna thank you. Uh, hope you like this. Please like, share, let people know about my channel. Until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thanks.